A Theory of Justice is a 1971 work of political philosophy and ethics by the philosopher John Rawls, in which the author addresses the problem of distributive justice. Uh, I know this is a very tall order, but is it possible for you to characterize comparatively briefly, I mean, within the context of a, a <laughs> television try. discussion, what it is that Rawls is saying? Yes, I, I, I think for, for that purpose, it would be a good idea to, to, to take up two topics in, in the book. The first is uh, the topic of the method he suggests and employs, and the second, the conclusions he reaches. Uh, and I think it's useful to distinguish them because some people are impressed with the one and not the other. The method is um, arresting. It's, in, it's intriguing. Rawls tells us that when we're concerned with questions of justice, what rules that could govern the basic structure of a society would be just, that the, we ought to think about those in the following way. We ought to tell ourselves a fairy story for a start. We ought to imagine a Congress of men and women who don't belong to any particular society yet, and who come together in a kind of constitutional convention. They're going to agree among themselves on a constitution, how their society is to be run. And they're like everybody else, these people. They have specific identities, specific weaknesses, specific strengths, specific interests. The only thing that makes them different is that they suffer from a total amnesia, the most crippling kind of amnesia. They don't know who they are. They don't know whether they're old or young, men or women, black or white, talented or stupid. In particular, this is very important, they don't know what their own individual moralities are. That is, they don't know. Each one has some conception of what he wants his life to be like, what his preferences are in sexual morality and so forth, but no one knows what his views are on those questions. So it's as if, as in Rawls's phrase, they were separated from their own personalities by a veil of ignorance. Now, these amnesiacs nevertheless must agree on a political constitution. Rawls says, if we ask ourselves what people in this strange situation would agree upon by way of a constitution, that the answer to that question will be, for that reason, principles of justice. This now, is a somewhat far-fetched thing to ask people to assume, isn't it? Well, it's, it's of course <laughs> far-fetched to ask them to assume that it ever has happened or could happen. Yeah. It's a dramatic way of asking people to imagine themselves making choices in their own self-interest, but without knowing things which separate one person from another. And that's, of course, just a way of enforcing uh, a certain conception of equality on political decisions. But, but for the moment, can we, I think it's better to not to leave behind the myth, because the myth has itself great power. Now, the question is, what would people in this situation agree upon? And that's the second question, namely, the second topic, namely, what conclusions does this method yield? These are two, and Rawls calls them the two principles of justice. They are principles, I should say, for a society with a certain measure of economic um, development, so that there's enough to feed everyone. Once you reach that point, says Rawls, people in the original position, as he calls this strange situation, would agree on the following two principles. First, Everyone shall have, to the greatest degree possible, the basic liberties which Rawls enumerates. These basic liberties are the political, the conventional political liberties, liberty to vote, liberty to speak on political matters, freedom of conscience. They also include freedom to hold personal property, to be protected in your person, not to be arrested suddenly and without due cause and so forth. The conventional, what you might call liberal liberties, are protected in this way. Secondly, the second principle of justice, no inequality in society, in distribution, no difference in wealth, is to be tolerated unless that difference works for the benefit of the worst-off group in the society. It's a very dramatic principle, the second principle. It means that if you could change society by making it overall poorer, so the middle class, for instance, was work substantially worse off. You should do so if the result of that is to benefit the lowest off group in the 
society. So you have two principles. The first is the principle that says there are certain liberties that must be protected. The second is the rather more egalitarian principle that says look to the situation of the worst off group. Every change in the social structure should benefit that group. The two principles are related through what Rawls calls the principle of priority. He calls it a lexicographic ordering and says that the first principle dominates over the second. What that means is that even if for example, it would benefit the worst off group in the society to abridge political liberties, take away rights of free speech. Even if that would benefit the worst off groups in society, you must not do it. Only when liberty has been protected to the full are you entitled to consider the economic questions raised by the second principle. When you do come to those economic considerations, you must benefit the worst off class but you can't do that until everyone's liberty is sufficiently protected. But why should we care about a hypothetical contract? I have emphasized that this original position is purely hypothetical. It is natural to ask why, if this agreement is never actually entered into, we should take any interest in these principles, moral or otherwise. The answer is that the conditions embodied in the description of the original position are ones that we do in fact accept. Or if we do not, then perhaps we can be persuaded to do so by philosophical reflection. Michael Sandel in his book, Justice, What is the Right Thing to Do, argues. What is the moral force of a hypothetical contract, a contract that never happened? But in order to investigate it, we need to turn to a modern philosopher, John Rawls, who worked out in his book, A Theory of Justice, in great detail, an account of a hypothetical agreement as the basis for justice. In order to answer that question, we have to look hard at the moral force of actual contracts. We see here there are really two different ways in which actual contracts generate obligations. One has to do with the act of consent as a voluntary act. And it points, Adam said this, was a Kantian idea, and I think he's right, because it points to the ideal of autonomy. When I make a contract, the obligation is one that is self-imposed. And that carries a certain moral weight, independent of other considerations. And then there's a second element of the moral force of contract arguments, which has to do with the sense in which Actual contracts are instruments of mutual benefit, and this points toward the ideal of reciprocity. That obligation can arise, I can have an obligation to you, insofar as you do something for me. I would like to argue first that the fact that two people agree to some exchange does not mean that the terms of their agreement are fair. When my two sons were young, they collected baseball cards and traded them. And one was, there was a two-year age, there is a two-year age difference between them. And so I had to institute a rule about the trades that no trade was complete until I had approved it. <laughs> And the reason is obvious. The older one knew more about the value of these cards and so would take advantage of the younger one. So that's why I had to review it to make sure that the agreement, that the agreements were fair. Now you may say, well, this is paternalism. <laughs> of course it was. That's what paternalism is for, that kind of thing. So what, what, what does this show? What does the baseball card example show? The fact of an agreement is not sufficient to establish the fairness of the terms. We tend to give less moral weight to the decisions of children, and that is the reason why we treat children and adults differently when they commit crimes or any generally considered immoral action. Cute, isn't it? Now imagine that instead of a child an adult was stealing the popcorn. Thus, actions of making a contract when done by children have less moral weight. 
this does not show that contracts, when made by alert adults, are not enforceable. I read some years ago of a case in Chicago. There was an elderly widow, an 84-year-old widow named Rose, who had a problem in her apartment with a leaky toilet. And she <coughs> signed a contract with an unscrupulous contractor who offered to repair her leaky toilet in exchange for $50,000. But she had agreed. She was of sound mind, maybe terribly naive and unfamiliar with the price of plumbing. <laughs> she had made this agreement. Luckily, it was discovered. She went to the bank and asked to withdraw $25,000. And the teller said, what do you need all of that money for? And she said, well, I have a leaky toilet. <laughs> and the teller called authorities, and they discovered this unscrupulous contractor. Now, I suspect that even the most ardent contractarians in the, in the room will agree that the fact of this woman's agreement is not a sufficient condition of the agreement being fair. The fact that lady was going to the bank to take out the money and assuming that she was of sound mind, it seems reasonable to conclude that she valued a fixed toilet more than $50,000. It should also be noted that searching for another plumber requires extra time and energy, as they are scarce resource, they need to be maximized. If someone values a fixed toilet in time and effort spent in searching for other plumbers, more than $50,000, it doesn't seem to follow that it's unfair to them, since they actually paid less than what they valued the repair at. This is a win-win situation. Reciprocity still holds here. If the plumber agreed to fix the toilet for free, almost no one would have any problem. Even though if you can argue that charging the lady too high removes reciprocity or autonomy, plumber agreeing to fix the toilet for free also removes reciprocity or autonomy. Should the lady be charged with fraud in this case? Let's say plumber makes a fair offer to fix the toilet in return of money, which any reasonable, rational, and fully informed person would agree. Nonetheless, the lady refused the offer. Did the lady act wrongly here? Is the lady obligated to accept a fair offer? Would it be okay for plumber to force the deal? Say, the plumber takes the money by force and fixes the toilet. When people question his acts, he argues that the lady rejected his fair offer, any reasonable person would agree to it, in a hypothetical condition, and that makes it morally okay for him to force the deal. This justification would find few converted. But, this is exactly what Rawls is advocating. He is advocating violence against people because this contract is fair. Rawls is not saying there is this contract which is unfair, therefore it should not be enforced. Thus my scenario is much more analogous to what Rawls is arguing than the scenario proposed by Sandal. Thus even if Sandal is right that fairness or reciprocity is required to raise obligation, though that is questionable, it will not prove that Rawls' hypothetical contract is of any relevance. An actual agreement is not necessary to their, it's not a sufficient condition of there being an obligation. I want to now make a, a stronger, maybe more controversial claim about the moral limits of actual contracts that a contract or an act of consent is not only not sufficient, but it's not even a necessary condition of there being an obligation. And the idea here is that if there is reciprocity, if there is an exchange, then a receipt of benefits, there can be an obligation even without an act of consent. This is based on a personal experience. Some years ago, I was driving across the country with some friends, and we found ourselves in the middle of nowhere in Hammond, Indiana. We stopped at a rest stop and got out of the car, and when we came back, our car wouldn't start. None of us knew much about cars. We didn't really know what to do until we noticed that in the parking lot driving up next to us was a van, and on the side it said Sam's Mobile Repair Van. And out of the van came a man, presumably Sam, 
And he came up to us, us and he said, can I help you? Here's how I work. I work by the hour for $50 an hour. If I fix your car in five minutes, you owe me the $50. And if I work on your car for an hour and can't fix it, you'll still owe me the $50. So I said, well, what is the likelihood that you'll be able to fix the car? And he didn't answer, but he did start looking under the, poking around under the steering column. Short time passed, he emerged from under the steering column and said, there's nothing wrong with the ignition system, but you still have 45 minutes left, should I look under the hood? <laughs> I said, wait a minute, I haven't hired you, we haven't made any agreement. And then he became very angry, and he said, do you mean to say that if I had fixed your car while I was working under the steering column that you wouldn't have paid me? And I said, that's a different question. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go into the distinction between consent-based and benefit-based <laughs> obligations. But I think he had the intuition that if he had fixed it while he was poking around, that I would have owed him the 50 bucks. I shared that intuition. I would have. But he inferred from that, this was the fallacy and the reasoning that I think lay behind his anger. He inferred from that fact that therefore, implicitly, we had an agreement. But that, it seems to me, is a mistake. It's a mistake that fails to recognize the distinction between these two different aspects of contract arguments. Yes, I agree, I would have owed him $50 if he had repaired my car during that time. Not because we had made any agreement, we hadn't. But simply because if he had fixed my car, he would have conferred on me a benefit for which I would have owed him in the name of reciprocity and fairness. So, here's another example of the distinction between these two different kinds of arguments, these two different aspects of the morality of contract. It seems like there is an implicit contract between Sam and Sandal. It went and stated, as we can't always make every agreement explicit in everything we say, it would take too long to agree to anything. To make sure that the obligation, in fact, did come from reciprocity and not implicit contract, let's tweak this scenario a little bit. Before Sam starts working on the car, Sanil explicitly stated that he will not be paying him anything whatsoever for fixing the car. Sam says okay and fixes the car. Is Sandal obligated to pay Sam now? Sure, it would be nice to pay, but it is difficult to see any obligation to pay. The condition of reciprocity is still satisfied. So if obligation came from reciprocity, explicit statement of Sandal should not affect the obligation. Thus, the obligation does not come from reciprocity. But if an obligation comes from an implicit contract, this absence of obligation makes perfect sense, because explicit dissent overturns implicit contracts. Sandal gives many such examples and argues that obligation comes from reciprocity, but in all of them obligation comes from implicit contract, this can be shown by making the implicit contract explicit. As we have already seen, Sandal fails to justify Rawls hypothetical contract. In this video, I heavily relied upon hypothetical arguments, Rawl seems to take issue with this approach. The point to keep in mind is that a conception of justice for the basic structure is worth having for its own sake. It should not be dismissed because its principles are not everywhere satisfactory. We understand specific situations much better than we understand how we should structure our society. This better understanding of specific situation helps us verify which ideas are true, so we can apply them to entire society. If our judgment is not applicable on a small and private scale, then what reason we have to believe that they will be applicable to the larger, political level? An explanation is required for dismissing such cases. As Brian Kaplan puts it, Weird hypotheticals are philosophers' equivalent of controlled experiments. When a scientist wants to test a physical theory, he sets up weird laboratory conditions that make it easy to find an exception to the theory. Similarly, when a philosopher wants to test a moral theory, he sets up weird examples that make it easy to find an exception to the theory. Is it true that you can also turn the pages of this telephone directory?
Yes, it is. And you will do that for us? I'll try. Should I take the pencil off the table? Sh yes. All right. There you are, James. You would like to open it to any page, or should you no, want me to do it? I'll be happy to. The amazing Randy maintains that you did not use psychic power, but that it was trickery. Hmm. And he is prepared to pay you $10,000 if you can do it using psychic power. Here he is, the amazing Randy. James, Randy, Randy. Okay. Now, you saw James' demonstration from backstage. Yes, I did. And do you accept that as a demonstration of psychic power, or do you believe that he used trickery? I don't accept it as a demonstration of psychic power, Bob. I think that the solution is rather simple. I think that Mr. Heydrich is merely to accomplish this effect, blowing on both the page and on the pencil. Now, what I have here is particles of a white plastic, which, when given a good puff, good heavy puff of air, will, I think, rather conclusively show whether or not blowing is a method accomplished. Now, it will not, perhaps, in some way, differentiate between genuine psychic power and actual blowing, but it certainly should be very interesting indeed to see what now occurs. James? Ready. James, you had another question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? What would you like okay. to Okay. The styrofoam and the lights form electricity which pulls the page. Look. See, that's well, it is the opinion of the judges that there is not enough static formed by the, the foam to be a problem. So, uh, under the conditions agreed upon, it uh, would seem that now you should at least try with psychic power to turn the page of the telephone directory, James. Okay. It's not going to uh, turn for you? No, it isn't. This isn't a magician's trick. I can't just come up, bang, bang, and it's over. I have to be to where I can work with something small and then big, you know, to build up my own self. James has not won the $10,000 with this demonstration. So it seems. Now, you have heard what uh, James's explanation is. Do you have any comment to make on that? Bob, the, the comment very briefly is that I have gone through many hundreds of these tests with many hundreds of people who claim to have psychic powers. And quite frankly, it's more or less the same story every time. When a simple, direct, very uncomplicated protocol is used and the control is applied, the psychic forces don't seem to be present, if indeed they are ever present at all. Well, at least an explanation was given. In this video I only criticized the method used by Rawls, not the conclusions, there are a lot more to say on his book, I will make another video about the faulty conclusions and other problems with Rawls' theory of justice. You may want to subscribe for that. Thanks for sticking around.